Good morning and welcome back to the broadcast for Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder and this is BRN AM for Friday, September 13th, 2019. Here are your headlines. We're going to go down under and take a look at Australia's superannuation fund. And then we're going to talk about best practices for plan sponsors and fiduciaries of retirement plans. But first, savings is a global issue. People around the globe need to save for retirement. And today we're going to take a look at the Australian superannuation fund. And joining me now to discuss the plan and some of the challenges it has is Dr. Michael E. Drew. He is a professor from Griffith University and also a managing director with Drew Walk and Company. Dr. Drew, thanks so much for joining us from Brisbane today. Good morning. So Dr. Drew, can you break down what are some of the basics of the superannuation plan in Australia? So in the early 1990s, uh, we moved to a contractual superannuation system in that it is moved completely, um, almost completely to a defined contribution model. Um, so most of the defined benefit plans in this country are now closed and the majority of retirement saving assets are in defined contribution or DC plans. So that really is the currency um, in this part of the world. Employers are legally required to make contributions on behalf of their employees. Employees can make additional contributions uh, to their fund. And in Australia, we call DC plans superannuation, which in the American context is probably closest to the 401k type structure. And what's the governance structure of the fund? So how is it uh, structured? Is it a federal system? Is it a, like a state system like we have here in the US? Yeah, so the, um, the governance structure is um, federally, is, the, is the, the laws and the, uh, the statutory duty of trustees and the duties of employers to pay into employees' accounts is all at the legal, legally at the federal level. Um, we have what we call very large superannuation funds. So the fund that I'm on the investment committee of is Q Super. We have 700,000 members, uh, about 100 billion Australian dollars in funds under management. Um, so these are very large monolithic um, investment organisations, fiduciary organisations that really bring a for purpose. So they're not for profit, they're a for purpose fund. Uh, they're there to serve the members of the fund, the, the plan members. And essentially that brings a great deal of scale to the to solving the investment problem. So as you can imagine with that sort of scale, it drives down fees dramatically. So some of the lowest fees um, in the world in these large funds and also allows good governance over a range of asset classes, including private assets, uh, infrastructure, uh, property, uh, private equity. So these are very sophisticated, large asset owners who design investment programs for their defined contribution members. So like any system, there must be uh, some level of challenges. What are some of the challenges of the program today? Is financial literacy, for example, a concern? The, yeah, these are universal, Jeff, absolutely universal challenges that we see around the world, particularly in defined contribution plans. So one of the benefits of the um, defined benefit structure was that when we had these conversations with our members, they would express it in terms like, I'm replacing two thirds of my salary for life. They, they expressed it as some sort of outcome frame where the challenge now with DC plans is making sure we assist people um, and, their, and their given levels of financial literacy with framing it in the retirement income sphere. So we're doing a lot of work in this part of the world on the design of the member benefit statement, moving from almost like a bank account, deposit, deposit, credit, a dollar based framing to a retirement income projection framing. Some of the funds here are using a stack of coins to show people visually 
where their stack of coins is against a modest level of retirement income and a comfortable level of retirement income. So there's been a huge investment in this part of the world on framing, uh, nudging, and particularly around how we can help those with, say, a base level of financial literacy uh, move into a framework that's understandable, things like retirement income, mm -hmm. rather than sort of framing it as a pot of gold. So a lot of money on data analytics, on ensuring that member communications are tailored to different parts of the life stage, and how do we sort of have a clarion call to action and these sort of visualizations of stacks and things like that, stacks of coins, seem to be very effective. So one of the challenges here in the United States is what we call deaccumulation. And we're, you know, we're waiting on some passage of the SECURE Act, which would allow for annuities in retirement plans. Is this a feature, are annuities a feature in the superannuation fund? And how are you tackling the uh, retirement income challenge in Australia? Yeah, we're, we're really, this is the big part of the next step in our journey that we began this system in the early 90s. And so now it's sort of gone from, um, say, 1992 when the system um, started. And now we're, you know, 25, 30 years sort of into that journey that there's really a big change in how we think through the income phase. So people can take some as a lump sum, they can decide to annuitize some or, or all, or they might have a managed payout type structure. Um, so there's a great deal of flexibility in Australia as to how you can receive this benefit. Um, a slight difference to the Australian setting to the US setting is that our equivalent of social security or the public pension is asset tested and means tested. Mm -hmm. So you can contribute to your taxes your whole life but if your retirement balance is sufficiently high and your asset balance is sufficiently high or income level is high, you can't participate in the public pension. So there's quite a um, important stage in this part of the world where folks need assistance in retirement income planning, which may include part of the pension and then being supplemented by their superannuation balance. Well, thanks, Dr. Drew. Stick around. We're going to go to commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Dr. Drew about the role of planned fiduciaries and what they can do to improve their role. It's an ever-changing world out there. So tune in right here on BRM AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But well, you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Welcome back, and uh, Dr. Drew has uh, graciously stuck around with us. We're gonna shift gears now from the superannuation fund now to uh, best practices for retirement plan fiduciaries. Dr. Drew, thanks for being so generous with your time. 
So you and Dr. Adam Walk recently wrote a book for the CFA Institute about the role of a fiduciary and fiduciary best practices. But I want to break it down for our audience. Let's define the word fiduciary. So fiduciary comes from the Latin uh, fiducia, to trust. Yeah. So fiduciary is really um, a very, very important framing for, for this work that uh, my dear colleague and co-author Adam Walk and I have been thinking about now for some time is how do we ensure that we have fulfilled a duty of trust, a, a special relationship of trust and confidence with those we serve? So how do we think of defending the beneficiary? How do we ensure that we place the, the duty and the beneficiary, the duty to the beneficiary at the heart of all we do? And also, let's talk a little bit about the CFA Institute. I think some of our listeners may be aware of this organization, but it's very prestigious. Can you discuss their body of work and also their goals and objectives? So the CFA Institute uh, are now the global standard in terms of professional designation for those uh, in the financial services industry. Uh, in terms of raising standards and best practice, the CFA Institute have a research foundation, a not-for-profit foundation, charitable foundation, and they commission authors from around the world to build a body of knowledge. And so Adam and myself have had the great joy of writing on this particular topic, investment governance for fiduciaries, and that then is part of raising standards in the global debate um, led by the CFA Institute. Obviously, that's a very prestigious organization. So every retirement plan has challenges. Uh, what are some of the challenges for pension trustees today? And what keeps you all awake at night? Yeah, my, my, it's been a great honor to be an investment committee member at QSuper. And, and one of those big challenges um, is that you are looking after the life savings in our instance of over 700,000 families. So it does hit you um, both professionally and personally as to the duty of care that needs to be taken with other people's money. The, maybe the, the three things, Jeffrey, that really keep us awake at night are ensuring that there's an alignment of the investment complex with the beneficiary's objective and ensuring that that alignment is consistent through time. So making sure that the beneficiary is at the heart of every decision and every, um, every process leads to ultimately their benefit, which is obviously retirement security. But that would be sort of number one. Number two, I think, is ensuring that as a fiduciary, you have a real clarity of objective and your role. So one of the big challenges we found with investment complexes under stress is that there tends to be sometimes some role confusion, and that can really lead to some very terrible outcomes because the the governance process breaks down. So ensuring roles are clear, the mission is clear, and that the implementation reflects those objectives, that's something that a fiduciary must continually look at in terms of um, ensuring great outcomes. And, and probably the third one, um, which is, um, I suppose, the balancing act, is that great investment governance is sort of two sides to one coin. We see it very much as the directional governance of the fund, policy, procedure, practice, the, the sort of the directional governance. Right. The one that keeps us awake at night is the other side of the coin as well, which is the relational side to governance. People, culture, trust. And the great fiduciary investors in the, around the world are able to, as a committee, balance, govern and understand the interplay between directional governance and relational governance. Being a trustee is a, has become rather dynamic and, you know, it's not just the quarterly meetings uh, every three months. It's, it's really a lot of learning and education um, th throughout the periods in between meetings. How, how has that evolved? That, that's absolutely fair. And I think your question strikes at the heart of great practice. Um, do we have, for instance, clear delegations to the chief investment officer, 
or the outsource CIO, however the organisation might be structured. Mm -hmm. But are those delegations very clear and the parameters decided before the facts? Does the committee have the ability that under stress to be nimble enough to be able to make decisions made by circular resolution? So if there's a particular event in markets or a geopolitical event, do we have, do we have a committee that is able to respond in a timely and considered way around those stresses on portfolios? Are the delegations able to do that? The last thing you want is some sort of rigid process yeah. where decisions yeah. going to be made three months to three months. On the flip side, you don't want decisions being made by trustees, you know, day to day. That, that doesn't seem sensible either. So clear delegation, clear sets of rules of engagement, role clarity, and if needed, is the investment governance complex nimble enough to respond? We talked about in segment one about financial literacy and it's important. And oftentimes, you know, pension, tr pension trustees, even here in the States and Australia and others, kind of view financial wellness and literacy as kind of the softer side, but it's something that's, uh, in my opinion, much needed. Um, are you seeing more and more conversations as from boards and trustees about this very important issue? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as you know, Jeffrey, um, in your long experience, uh, people don't live off and they don't eat information ratios, or they don't eat sharp ratios. They think about outcomes that are meaningful to them in their context. So I think sometimes it's really very important for trustee boards to do a skills audit, yeah. to really look at the skill sets Obviously, it's important to have investment skills within that mix, but you need to ensure there are skills around understanding the member perspective, challenging the way in which objectives are set to ensure they clearly align with beneficiaries' best interests. So there's a really interesting EQ exercise around the structuring of boards and that skill. The other one, which we, as you know, in our monograph, um, we talk a lot about is this fiduciary line making sure that the committee knows where that governance line is, the strategic line, the governance that occurs above that line, and ensuring there's excellent monitoring, superintending of the implementation phase below that line. And how do you bring that out and monitor and review in light of the objectives? So it really is a continuous process for us around how you can bring the best of the human dimension and the investment dimension, the directional governance, the relational governance, because as you know, under stress, we have to be able to coordinate all of those levers. So th this book and these principles that you at Dr. Walk came up with, they're not just for Australian pension funds. They are for pension funds, trustees of retirement plans, endowments around the globe, including the United States. Yes, and, and also regardless if you're in uh, a defined contribution plan, a family office context, a private wealth manager, uh, a, a charitable fund, these are, we, we have really written this book to be a set of enduring principles. It's not simply a, a checklist, and I think that's part of the problem historically in governance, particularly investment governance, is that at times, we can think that great governance is more checklists, yeah. more compliance, tick, tick, tick. There must be another checklist to make this better. What we're really framing this uh, monograph is around stewardship, around thinking about the best of how can we bring great directional governance to the problem we're trying to solve, and how do we think through behaviours and rewarding behaviours of trust, culture, alignment, and the human dimension of decision making within the governance framework. Well, Dr. Drew, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today and appreciate you making time. There's a bit of a time difference between the United States and Australia, so appreciate you setting aside some time for us. And uh, we'll look to have you back on the program shortly. Thanks, Jeffrey. Well, that wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Happy Friday the 13th to you all. And uh, hey, have a topic or someone of interest that you think might be interesting to uh, interview, drop us a line. And don't forget, for the latest news in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, check out today's edition of The Morning Pulse. So until next Monday, keep on saving and don't forget, 
roll with the changes. Waiting, you fight, you take and